Carlton Pearson, and welcome to Come Monday. Come Sunday was the movie. Come Monday is the movement into what I call expanded consciousness, a radical new paradigm, spiritual paradigms, new ways of thinking and being, evaluating, uh, processing, a new way of... Um, even a new language, a new way of expressing yourselves. You know, the kids are coming up with their own language. The Generation X and the Millennials have their own words. My daughter comes up with a different way of expressing something every day. I've become a pupil to my own kids. I mean, I'm learning from them. Uh, because they, when, when a new age occurs, the language and sometimes the music changes. I'm talking to musicians and psalmsters. Um, at my, my I call them songsters, uh, people who are lyricists to to rethink the lyrics that they they're writing, and many people who are uh, from fundamentalist backgrounds are hearing a different sound, and they're different hearing a different way to say things. I'm fascinated. I've never been more fascinated in my life about, and I think my deep classical Pentecostal roots informs this curiosity that I'm having uh, because I've had tremendous transcendent transformative experiences over the last 66 years that I've been on the planet 66 of which six uh, 60 of which I was quote unquote filled with the Holy Ghost baptized speaking in tongues having these transcendent moments fasting and praying and I still do all of that and love it uh, it's not so religious as much as it is mystical and spiritual and powerful uh, and I think I'm part of my reason for being here this last half of my life maybe the main reason is to help re um, craft if you will a and re uh, uh, and recognize another assignment another sign or design to the way we spiritualize the way we come out as spiritual people the way we express or ex press out of us something that religion institutional religion is held bound and I'm I'm just preoccupied with it. One of the things that have really inspired me is this whole uh, issue with religion in the world and how religion, particularly here in America, evangelical Christianity, of which I've been a part for so many years, has had such a huge impact on the present administration and the present uh, politics um, and in our Congress. And I've been very unhappy about a lot of things that are happening. And so I've just been investigating and protesting and thinking. And I, I believe it's in the language of my background, the Holy Ghost is dealing with me. The Spirit of God is moving me to rethink and to represent, not represent Jesus, but to represent Jesus. Many people look for the truth of the Bible. I look for the truth about it. A lot of people look for the truth in Jesus. I, I'm interested in the truth about Jesus. I'm particularly interested in the 18 years that the Bible is silent on him from age 12 to age 30. Uh, where was he? What was he thinking? What was he doing? He didn't write anything. We don't know what he was experiencing. He didn't come back s saying anything about that experience. We heard, heard a little bit about his 40 days of the wilderness temptation. Uh, some people think he was in Egypt. Some people think he was in, in India, studying in the ashrams and learning the he healing sciences and uh, various aspects of new thought or expanded ways of thinking. He might have met with extraterrestrials. We don't know. 18 years he was gone. Uh, and the Bible doesn't, nobody seems to ask any questions. There doesn't seem to be this great curiosity in the mystery or the missed story of Jesus, where he was. Remember, he only had three and a half years of ministry. And we're still talking about him 2,000 years later. The first 12 years, there's a little bit here and there, the birth, mostly the neat, uh, the, um, the, um, uh, his birth in Bethlehem and the whole story of Mary, the virgin and all that. But then uh, talking with the wise men in Jerusalem at the temple, and that was it. Nothing else. Until he's 30 years old. He comes out of the wilderness. John sees him coming in the reeds of the, uh, the river Jordan. He says, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That's not a Jewish thought. No Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. That was human. There were goats and lambs. Literally, that was part of the atonement and the blood. And I've re- thought this whole idea about blood sacrifices and blood transactions that a particular God would demand. And of course, the Judeo-Christian God isn't the only one who has demanded that throughout history, men have, humankind has noticed uh, and had a fear of the gods trying to appease a difficult, an angry one or please a difficult one and to keep that God from killing them. Death and life run second uh, seconds to each other. They're like first and second cousins. And um, so 
people are always concerned about life after this one. That's why death is so critical to people because most of us suspect or detect that maybe there is something beyond this one. And even something maybe before this life or something besides this life. That's the new way of thinking. This whole preoccupation with um, drugs and, and conscious altering uh, substances. Not just alcohol, but weed is big all over the world. Everybody's talking about it. I understand that in Colorado, they just legalize mushrooms. Uh, I had uh, one conversation with a young man who had been a youth minister of mine, and he had this experience with mushrooms. And he said to me, Pasha, I'll never have fear of death. I had this experience, and he described it. It was quite ethereal, quite esoteric, quite mystical, mysterious pretty fascinating to me and I'm a guy that loves out of body experiences that uh, was hinted to me when I had my t moments of praying in the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and weeping and my time away for you know three and seven and 14 and 21 and 30 day fasts on ranches all over the country and up in the mountains of Pennsylvania and I always had this amazing draw toward the 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 less than the natural the spiritual or mystical or a transcendent moments. I respect it because they're so real. People can doubt your testimony. People can doubt your theology. But nobody can doubt your experience because that's yours. You own it. It belongs to you. Nobody can take it from you. It's embedded in the memories and memories of your soul. You nurture it and you think about it. And it's so powerful. I've never been high on a drug, but I've been high on spirit. And people who are into drugs that become addicted to them for whatever reasons... I've been addicted not so much to religion, though there was many years of my life that I was, but I'm still very attracted to and, and possessed by this amazing fascination with uh, the extra terrestrial. <laughs> And I'm just talking about, I'm not just talking about aliens, but alien experience, foreign experiences, something that that because familiarity breeds contempt, the culture itself is becoming bored with itself. And so we're trying to find something. We got Graham says hello from Scotland. Are you actually in Scotland or you just live there and are over here? Anyway, hello, Graham. Welcome to the, to the program tonight. God bless you and be you. I've been to Scotland. I love, I actually stood and preached in the very church where, where Dwight L. Moody preached in, in uh, what's the main town there in Scotland? Um, um, anyway, I forgot. You, you know what it is. I drove up from northern England into uh, Gla Glasgow, I guess it is. But it was wonderful. Anyway, one of these days we're going to come to Scotland. I hope there's a bunch of you over there who are rethinking what you believe and why you believe it and how those beliefs add to and subtract from the quality of your lives because we want to meet you. We're all on our way to greater enlightenment and we're going to meet each other there in consciousness. Tonight, I'm... Um, Next Thursday, by the way, I'm going, this coming Thursday, I'm going to be live um, with a, a young man whom I just met briefly. Uh, I was actually, he was actually introduced to me by the, the, what we call the Master Prophet Bernard E. Bernard Jordan in, I think it was North Carolina. We had a brief conversation. He's contacted me since. Um, I don't even know his age, but he pastored for 20 years, and now he and he was a comedian and entertainer. Now he's been out of the ministry 20 years, and he has his own nationally syndicated radio program. And he interviews. He's very, he's almost risque. He's he's kind of loose, and some people would consider him obnoxious. But I I find it to be quite brilliant that he's and he's a thinker. He understands the cultural iconoclasms that out of which I have come and in which I was raised and he was too because we're preachers of the gospel and now he's talking about everything. I mean he, he tackles any issue out there. Um, run that that little spot uh, Jason so so the people can see it because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be live and uh, um, what's the name? I forgot everything. Um, uh, you Larry can, you, you can say, Yeah, Larry Reed. Um, we've been texting a lot. And I'm going to go on his show for like two hours live, seven to nine, I think it is, um, central, or whatever it says on that. On that. 9 p.m. Eastern. It's 9 Eastern, so that's 8 p.m. to 10, and it's 9 to 11 there. And he and I are just going to talk about our journeys. 
and we're going to deal with questions like the Bible, what, where it came from, what we understand about it, things about uh, angels in heaven and hell, all the stuff people are always asking me about it, what radical inclusion is, about human sexuality and homosexuality. He contacted me because a friend of mine turned down an opportunity to speak at a church pastored by two male uh, lovers. I mean, they're married, a man and a man, and one is the pastor, the other was called the First Gentleman. I heard that the first time in Atlanta with uh, Bishop Allen down there, and I, I thought, well, you guys have really gotten out. That was pretty classy to call. Instead of the First Lady, it was called the First Gentleman. Well, that's still pretty shocking to a lot of Christian people and fundamentalists and Pentecostals. So he said, would I be willing to talk about it? Because the Bishop Trotter, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, was invited to speak and he turned it down and he made reference to me in the interview because a friend of mine, uh, Ricky Dillard, uh, mentioned him that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm his spiritual father. I wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with Rick or, Rick, Ricky Dillard being quote unquote born again, or but, but he likes my new way of thinking. And it's dangerous for Christians, particularly musicians and public people to embrace because some people consider me a heretic, anything that I say or think, uh, it's not that they disagree with me, but it's not good for business. A lot of these guys are saying, Doc, don't stop talking, don't stop preaching. We're reading your books and literature. Uh, we, we really don't have a theological problem with you. It's a business decision. We got to eat. We have pensions and parsonages. And, you know, when you, when you have a ministry that has been, and we're dealing with it like 2,000 years of, in, of, um, of uh, indoctrination, so uh, it's going to be hard for some people to make the turn. It's like turning a great big ocean liner around. You can't do that on a dime. It takes a while to turn. And, but I was talking to a young woman in San Diego that I grew up with. She's around my age. I knew her pastor. I preached my second revival in her dad's church. I love the man and his wife is who's still living. And she, she didn't even hardly ever go to church. She's, she's brilliant. She's involved in social justice and um, human rights. And she's still spiritual. She still, still loves God, understands her experience of the Holy Ghost, Pentecostal girl, Church of God in Christ, just like me. But she's not stuck. She's not stagnated. And she's comfortable talking to me and, and me to her. And I'm hearing from thousands of people, literally, who are reconsidering what they believe. Um, this is the great falling away. <laughs> <laughs> that folks have been afraid of the great apostasy. I mean, we are falling away or stepping away from the dogma and some of the doctrines and the traditions of our fathers or of our elders, whom we dearly love and cherish and respect, but we saw them suffer psychosis. And I, I would, they haven't been clinically diagnosed as mentally ill, but I was around a lot of mentally ill people. I grew up with them, people I loved dearly who raised me who imparted life to me and death. And I saw them struggling and strangling almost over what they believed. And the, I have always found that bothersome. Some of them were the sweetest, most humble, kind, generous people. But there was another part of them that was totally and almost terminally vexed. There was anger, there was resentments, there was confusion. And uh, nothing is more deceptive than an obvious fact. Uh, Arthur Conan Dole, who, who wrote all this, the, the um, uh, Sherlock Holmes series. Apostle, uh, Linda Threat sent me a notebook and that was on the, on the front of it. Sarah Jordan Paul just gave it to me last night. And it says, nothing is more deceptive than an obvious fact. I'm going to talk about that because it's pretty interesting. There's a link to Larry Reed live um, in the comment section so you can watch it live. You can go look up, look, look him up right now, go online. He's quite brilliant. He, he's a lot more humble than he comes across. He's, he, he's almost like shock jock on radio. I mean, he really says stuff. <laughs> And um, I'm willing to, 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 uh, to spend two hours with him because I think he's as curious as I am about everything. Even though I've been in this, I've lived a lot longer than him. I suppose he's quite a bit younger, but um, he's sharp, he's smart. And I'm dealing with a lot of thinkers who are coming out of the closet to expanded consciousness. People think coming out of the closet is always about sexuality. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it isn't. People are just coming out of that closed-in place uh, and they're rethinking. They have... Their God in that box, their Bible in that box, their religious faith is, is smuggled and smothering in that box. And they're struggling and strangling with what they believe. And it's really hard. A fact is a thing that is known to be consistent with objective reality. 
and can be proven to be true with evidence. A lot of our faith is not built on fact as much as it's built on fantasy. None of it is provable. Now, there are evidences in our faith walks, whatever particular faith you're involved in, that suggest to you that what you believe might be close to the truth or factual. But because we don't have any of the original copies of the Bible, uh, we don't even know where they are. We have copies of copies of copies, and there are thousands of them. And then there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books that would have that that they're called intertestamental literature or the apocrypha that are not in the the uh, Judeo Christian Bible or the Protestant Bible. Uh, they're in the Catholic Bible. There's only like 72 books in the Catholic Bible and 66 books in the Protestant Bible. Um, but there's arguments. There have been for centuries literally for centuries, uh, arguments about God and good and morality and customs and traditions and faith. And there's been a lot of very sensible people over the years who've been, you know, demonized and made to be called heretics. And I, I never complain about somebody calling me a heretic because what they did to heretics several hundred years ago compared to what has been done to me is no comparison. I mean, they tortured and tormented the Catholic Church mostly, but it was all based on belief in God and defending the faith and all that kind of stuff. They did horrible things to, to heretics. They disembodied them, sometimes disemboweled them, uh, threw them into rivers and burnt them at the stake and peeled the skin off their body and stuck sharp objects up their fingernails and peer, picked the beards out of their hands and just clipped their genitalia and cut them to make them recant. And many did because it was just too painful not to. Uh, and they did this to, to Christians as well. So, but religion is, is mean and can be terrible. So I've been, just like Sherlock Holmes was a fictitious detective, I'm a real one. I want to seek the, a detective is an investigator. You know, usually official member of a law enforcement agency, but not always. Sometimes they are they're private de um, private detectives, often unlicensed, and they they help find criminals. They help solve crimes, or uh, including historical crimes. And I've I've been doing a lot of detective work, examining, evaluating clues, and uh, looking at personal records as detectives do, and interviewing people, and reading, and collecting information to solve these crimes. I think that religion is, is guilty of crimes against humanity. Institutional religion, particularly but not exclusively, Christianity. If you do the research, uh, and the reason this awakens to me because I've seen some very vicious, mean-spirited responses to me and to things I say or have said. I don't read a lot of that stuff because you can tell the people are just mentally ill. I mean, they're psychotic. Some they're crazy. <laughs> and but I was I've been there, so I understand. There was times when I was angry enough to do something vicious and violent, or to endorse it, or to look the other way and approve of it, like many, many millions of Christians and Catholics did when Hitler was torturing the Jesus killers called the Jews. Jesus himself was a Jew. The Bible is written by all, Luke's the only one in there who's not a Jew. Everybody was written. They were Hebrews. The Bible is a Jewish book written to Jews by Jews about a Jewish understanding and for Jews. They weren't considering uh, the Gentiles or the heathen, as they're called in the King James Version. Um, it's only, there's only about 15 million on the planet, as opposed to 2 billion Christians and 2 billion Muslims and, you know, billions of Hindus and these other religions. Um, I've been studying religions and, and, and discussing uh, and having interfaith dialogues. And I've come to some conclusions and some pre-conclusions that I'm still, you know, navigating and negotiating. But I don't believe like I used to believe anymore. A lot of people know what they believe, but they just don't believe what they know. A lot of people uh, think they believe what they know, but they don't know what they believe. They're all out there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing some detective work. I'm checking out databases and searching records and... <clears throat> 
And of course, this leads the detective to arrest or be a part of the of the arrest and conviction uh, of of criminals. We've been criminal, and I'm not I'm not trying to arrest anybody. I'm just thinking. I want to, when I say arrest, I want to stop some of this foolishness that is so duplicitous and so destructive and so vicious and so violent to so many people, and has been that way for years. Again. This whole idea of the whole community supporting a president who seems to be amoral, who seems to be a habitual liar, an open, vagrant, flagrant, arrogant, narcissistic type guy that some of the most intelligent people in government and uh, hundreds of psychologists and uh, former um, uh, members of our, of our Department of Justice uh, are coming out and saying, this guy's reckless, he's, he's dangerous. We, how do we get here? Christians, evangelical Christians are the ones that are his base. And all the, the most incendiary things he says is to appeal to his base. And I'm just so bothered by that because that was my life. It isn't today the way it once was. But I'm thinking, what are these people thinking? I, I'm for being tolerant. I promise you. I'm one of the most tolerant people. But there's a line that you draw when it comes to morality and kindness and humility and compassion. Uh, more, these people are more into the law than into love. And there's a lot of elitism and arrogance and bigotry and racism involved in it. And it, I'm calling it out. Uh, because I think that's important. And so, um, again, a detective may work for the police, or which I would say in this case the church, or privately, which is my case. I'm, nobody's paying me to do this. I wish somebody was. Uh, I'm not getting paid for what I'm doing. I'm, and I'm not trying to, I don't, but I don't report to some angry board or some trustees that could tell me that i got to stop. That's the one thing that I love most about not pastoring. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't have to be afraid of losing members. I don't lost thousands. And uh, you can't take anything. I lost my building. I lost my property. I lost my place in the society. Um, there are people in this town that are fundamentalists who, who would, would block something that I'm trying to do just because, like buy a house or buy stuff or get a loan for something. Some people that will try to block that because of my, uh, you know, my, my theological deviation. And they think they're doing the work of the Lord by stopping me. So I understand all that. The term or title uh, of detective comes from a word that means to detect, which is to discover or identify the presence or existence of something. A rat, <laughs> a cat, a snake or secret in the grass. I'm finding these things out. I find them bothersome. And uh, I'm trying to identify them to because I consider myself a peace agent. P-E-A-C-E. A cultural creative a spiritual progressive, an expanded consciousness advocate, a sacred humanist. Nobody ever has to call me bishop, pastor, evangelist, prophet, or apostle again. I will be called that probably the rest of my life, a bishop or a son of a bishop. I get them both these days. <laughs> but um, those names don't necessarily flatter me. Um, I'm not completely disowning them, but I want to be remembered as somebody who cared about humanity, I think Jesus was a sacred humanist, a humanitarian. Uh, Messiah, they called him Christ, and teacher, and rabbi, and rabboni, and master, and all that kind of thing. Um, he was a man. And his favorite title for himself, according to the narrative, is son of man, not son of God. Though we know him as the son of God and call him a son of God, but we're all sons of God's. In fact, the Hebrew Bible says, in the beginning, gods, not God, but gods, Elohim, created the heavens, the higher reaches and spaces and places of consciousness, and one earth. A bunch of floors and spaces and dimensions uh, and measurements of life and light. And there are now, we're finding there's billions of galaxies, and the earth is one little tiny uh, pale blue spot in the in the in the universe and um are we the only ones that count are we the only ones that uh are sinners or saints you know there's got to be more out there i believe there's more i believe there's other worlds and other ways and other realms and other reigns and other regions and other rhythms and other reaches of consciousness i'm so excited about that 
I, uh, I know there, it's like they're summoning me. They're calling me. I feel it. I, I sense it in my soul. You do too. You who are following and watching and listening. You're just as curious as I am. And I hope I trigger your curiosity all the more. And so uh, to detect, to discern something that's intangible or barely perceptible. I detect something. It's from a Latin word, which is detect. And it means to uncover or to expose, uh, to give somebody up, you know, or to turn somebody in, use their suspect or convict, uh, criminal, to give them away. So... Um, I want to expose what's out there and the real or hidden nature of what of what's real around us. I'm fascinated with it. Like I've always been. I've been doing some detective work for the last 15 or 20 years of my life. I've been interrogating and excavating and investigating myself, my own soul. I've asked myself what I believe in, what I, why I believe in, why I'm doing what I do. When I had to stop abruptly, that was a wake up call for me. One, one, you know, when one day I woke up and everything was gone. I just got another uh, letter from Harvard uh, uh, Divinity School. They want, I'm going to meet up with a representative of the Harvard Divinity School in Spokane at the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly to discuss some more things that I have uh, that, that they want in their archives. They've, I mean, they have 15 years of all my Azusa music, uh, music um, all the preachers, my good old classical Pentecostal, neo-Pentecostalist preachers and teachers from anybody from Oral Roberts to Joyce Meyer to Benny Hinn to Noel Jones to T.D. Jakes to Miles Monroe to Bishop G.E. Patterson J. Uh, to Charles Blake, R.W. Shamp. You go through the list. Ernestine Reams, Iverna Tompkins. Um, I've got all this, and I'm the only Pentecostal they have in the in, that I know of in the in the archives. They're going through that stuff, pouring over all that stuff I had in storage for 15 years, collecting dust. Nobody wanted my stuff, and Harvard asked for it, and I granted it through Doctor Doctor Walton there. So, um, and now they want more. I said, Well, you got so much stuff. I don't even know how you got through it. And they're saying, Is there anything else? The Smithsonian wants some. Uh, the Black Museum, uh, the African American Museum at the Smithsonian has asked for some things. So I want to make it, even the ORU archives may want something, I don't know. <laughs> they have a lot of stuff but uh, of mine from the years that I was there. Uh, but uh, a lot of the things I did on television belong not to ORU but to ORA. And that's, that's now uh, President Richard Roberts has that and is in charge of that. So we may never get that. But it's out there. TBN has a lot of footage. Uh, Pentecost has a powerful history in this country. Yes, there was a lot of insanity. Yes, there was a lot of almost stupidity. But there was also some sacred transcendence. I saw miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in faith. Uh, I also saw a lot of foolishness. I saw fantasies. I saw imaginations. I saw psychosis. But in the mix, I don't throw the baby out with the bat. I had some genuine experiences. I can't doubt that. So I'm so very interested in furthering that and expanding, and it's, and it's very, very powerful. Um, people either know what they believe but don't necessarily believe what they know, or they believe what they know and, but don't know really for sure what they really believe anymore. And that's where I am with, with asking these questions. And there's far more confusion than fusion out there. Fusion is the process of, uh, you know, or, or the result of joining two things together to form a single or to form a whole or an entity. Uh, confusion, though, is, is lack of understanding and uncertainty. There's a lot of that, more than I've ever seen. This, it's the state of being bewildered and uncertain and, and unclear in your mind about something. And it's okay, okay? That confusion I wrestled with for many years without speaking of it. I dared not speak of how confused I was standing on the great platforms of the greatest churches in America and preaching passionately and compassionately and under a measure of the anointing and seeing results as far as the people responding to the message and sometimes the messenger or both. But uh, confusion is often a situation of panic. Uh, a breakdown of order and I started going through that I was having some kind of a quiet riot all these years I'm preaching and pastoring here creating traffic jams on Sunday at our church and the greatest of conferences and packing some of the largest venues in this uh, churches in the country and some of the largest places around the world and I loved it and I was having a blast until again the Holy Ghost started dealing with me and questioning me probing me 
uh, bothering me. The Holy Ghost became a nuisance, an irritant to me. Because I start saying, this got to be the devil. It's like, it's like when Jesus, the story of Jesus walking on the water, Peter first thought it was a ghost. Peter had fallen in the water. or well, He hadn't fallen in the water yet, but he was in the boat and a storm came up and he saw this, this dude with his, with his afro all stuck to his head. <laughs> his dreadlocks are hanging all crooked. Jesus is walking on the water, according to the narrative. And um, Peter thought it was the occult. Then Jesus said, it's me, don't be afraid. And Peter doubted according to the narrative. If you're me, let me do something that's really crazy. If this is really you, Jesus, then bid me come to you on the, on the, on the water. Let me walk on the water. And Peter walked for a few minutes on the water till he realized how ridiculous or ridicule lust that was in his own mind. He started ridiculing himself. What am I doing in the strong walking on water? And that's when his faith wavered. He went down, but then Jesus, of course, pulled him right up according to the narrative. The scriptures, and he walked. I've always been fascinated with that story, whether it really happened or not. It just the whole concept is pretty brilliant. Anyway, religion, uh, institutional religion these days uh, runs the risk of being exposed as a type of a placebo uh, whose secret card is now being peeped. People are saying, eh. That ain't the real thing, because I've had some experiences that go deeper than sitting in a church service, particularly traditional, boring, dead services. Our Pentecostal services were so loud and voluminous, and there was a lot of energy and movement. We danced, we sang, there was drum beats and chants and rhythmic uh, mantras that kind of got us into some altered state of mind. You know, the eyes rolling back and speaking in tongues and rolling on the floor and it might seem have seemed crazy and it did to especially strangers who came, but to us who were in it, it was like being high. You know, it's like people going crazy at a football game and nobody apologizing for them jumping up and screaming and hollering because somebody takes a pigskin ball, pumped it with air and runs it across a touchdown line or same with a basketball, the sports arenas of the world. Uh, our churches were uh, climactic. They were almost orgasmic. The services were so, most of them, were so alive. Uh, we got turned on, and there was emotional transcendence and weeping and laughter, and, you know, you don't see a lot of that as much today uh, as as you did 40 years ago and 50 years ago or 100 years ago when, when this was starting in America. But, you know, a placebo is a harmless pill or medicine or procedure <clears throat> sometimes a medical procedure prescribed more for the psychological benefit of the patient than for the physiological effect. A placebo. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it was a measure designed merely to calm uh, the person, like a placebo or to placate or to pacify, uh, to appease somebody who was hostile or angry or to make them less angry, more a little bit more docile, to calm them down. Religion does do that for some people. Some people, it makes them more angry and hostile and volatile. Uh, but other people, has, and there have been times when it has really fired me up. There have been times when it just calmed me down. I can listen to a highly energetic song today and cry and quicken and feel the Holy Ghost as I did as a little boy at six years old. Or then I can listen to more of a ballad and more of a subdued song and go into meditation and worship, weeping sometimes. And just listen. I spend a lot of time in thought, a lot of time in meditation, a lot of time in contemplation, a lot of time being pensive and questioning. I, I'm a night owl. I rarely am asleep before one o'clock, and a lot of times I'm up till like three in the morning. And uh, I'm studying and I'm listening. And um, I, I sometimes I get really calm. I, I'm not kept awake with problems. I'm kept awake with solutions and resolutions, and sometimes dissolutions. Some things are dissolving at night when I'm thinking uh, and dismissing stuff. You know, I'm deleting things. I'm downloading some things, deleting some things. Uh, I, sometimes I shut everything down and restart my whole spiritual computer. Uh, and um, um, again, the same guy who, who I quoted at the top of the, the program today, uh, nothing is more deceptive than an obvious fact. Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, who wrote the whole series on uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, I think there were 60 some of them in books and stuff. Um, he said, it may be that you are not yourself luminous, uh, 
but that you are a conductor of light. Some people, without possessing genius, have a remarkable power of stimulating it. Mm. Some of the most simplistic folk I know um, have spurred me into depth of thought. Sometimes that's my little puppy named Cash. It's my daughter's dog, a little Yorkshire Terrier uh, uh, teacup, very tiny thing, sleeps with me most nights. Uh, she's precious. She's our little bisexual dog, we call her, because she's humping on everything, and I don't know how she learned how to do that. It's crazy. I, I, and she, 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 she get her, put her head all down and get all into it. I'm thinking, I, I tried to cast the devil out of her, but it didn't go to me. <laughs> Uh, but she's a very sensitive little puppy, and we're fascinated. She knows she can sense when we're coming. We live in a gated community. When when one of us who lives in the house comes to the gate, and that's a little bit of a drive around the block and up to our our home, uh, she she senses it. Um, she I got I had a little cut on my finger from an ingrown fingernail, and she went right to the infected nail and just begin to sniff around and try to like Lazarus was licked by the dogs. There's a, there's a medicinal healing property in the saliva of dogs. Many people don't know that. And she started licking uh, this, this area of my finger. I was repulsed at first and then I just realized that she was, there was a healing property in her spirit. Um, I learned from her. I learned from the simple things of nature. Where we live, sometimes uh, there are geese. A goose actually came up on the terrace and sat next to it. I have a picture. I can show you the picture. This big old goose standing next to the flower, a pot of flowers there. And then the, the ducks that are out in the water and the koi and, and uh, the um, uh, fish that come up. It's just fat turtles. I love nature. I love the little rose bed that we have there that I had the gardener plant last summer. It's just so lush and beautiful. I love begonias. And I put two, two, twice as many out this year. They're red and bright, and they stay that way till pretty much the end of fall. Um, but I learned from nature. I learned from nurture. I'm learning from experience and expressing the deeper aspect of myself. And so truth transcends fiction. Truth transcends fact. Truth transcends folklore and fairy tale. You want it. You're interested in it. It's fascinating to you. It's transcendent to you. It's transformative to you. It invigorates and reinvigorates your very soul. And you can't even define it. Sometimes we can't even find it. We speculate because it it shifts like like a, a drop of water or a, a snowflake. It changes. It morphs and and moves and and changes before our very eyes. Facts change too. So you can't really tie truth down. I've been talking about it a lot. Life will always be a kind of a, a common garden, one like the Garden of Eden with serpents in it. Nakash in Hebrew, to hiss or to prognosticate an augury. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Sss. When people go shh or pss, 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 everybody's listening. There's something intriguing about the serpent who said, you won't die if you eat of the tree, according to the narrative, whether it's allegory or metaphor or metaphysical. You will become like gods. And of course, Eve listened. They ate. She served some to her husband, Adam, and they became like gods, according to the narrative. Then the gods said, this consortium or council of deities said, now they have become like us. Scientists or knowing, conscious of the good and evil and the evil and good. That's what that really means. That there is a science of good and a science of evil and they intersect and they don't necessarily oppose each other. They don't necessarily compete with each other. They may complete each other or complement each other. Isn't that fascinating? What if there's no good or bad, good or evil, just decisions and choices with consequences, a sequence or sequel to that act? That makes a lot of sense to me. And there's nothing wrong with spirit or mystical things making sense. You know, you have this this brain, this, and it's 80% water, and you're 50 to, a full-grown adult, 50 to 60% water, 
moisture, mist and mysticism and mysteries, air, breath. He gave up the ghost, means he gave up his pneuma, the spirit. We get the word pneumon, lung, or pneumatic. I mean, not pneumatic, but uh, pneumonia from that term. The breath, the essence. He gave up that. I've been in the room when persons breathe their last breath, and that energy, that spirit came out of them, and you could still feel its presence in the room. It's the same thing you feel when that sort of esoteric mystical experience when somebody comes into the world, a baby is born. I was in the room twice when my children were born, my son and daughter. And I felt that same energy or ambience once a spirit left this realm or had a, the, the, that the person had an out of body experience and eventually that spirit went wherever spirits go or became whatever spirits are anew. Just fascinating. Now, <clears throat> I uh, I went to get my card, this this uh, uh, cannabis card. I have this terrible pain under my left foot because I had some surgery three years ago, and it was supposed to be a three week recovery. And it's the most severe and constant chronic pain I have. It's I guess a scar tissue. I was scheduled for surgery last Monday, and I put it off. I told the the uh, the uh, podiatrist that I wanted to wait and go check this out. I sat with this doctor for like twenty minutes. And he didn't even ask to see this store. And the thing came in the mail. Now, I've never smoked pot, probably never will, but I, I will go get the oils and all that kind of stuff and see if it helps. Um, you know, the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nation. Don't you forget that. That's, that's what your Bible says. <laughs> it's all in the Garden of Whedon. Um, it, it, you, it, I think it might have been a little cannabis out there. We know it's an herb. It's a natural herb, and it's not addictive, and um, and you don't overdose on it. And I think it can lead. I can. I think it can be an entrance drug and lead you to other things. But so can sugar, and too much sodium, and too much coffee, and just too much food in general. So anything can be addictive and or a dictator to you. Something that's dictating to you, getting in the middle of the night, you got to go in there and get that last piece of chocolate cake or go get another. I love to get up in the middle of the night if there's a drumstick in there and grab it and wolf it down. Or just a salad. <clears throat> I'm learning how to adjust to all these different things and all that's good to the pure. All things are pure. I still believe that. Uh, but things can be destructive to you if you don't know what you're doing. Eden is the same word for paradise, meaning uh, in in in, in uh, <clears throat> the Hebrew and Greek references will be to the same place. Pleasant, pleasing, appeasing, if you will. However, paradise... Uh, unfortunately has parasites there can be something in your paradise that is a parasite it wouldn't have parasites a, an organism it's a life form a life formation that lives in or on another organism it's a it's a life form that lives on another life form we all have them and you become the host you know and and that particular parasite benefits by deriving nutrients at the host's expense. Now, I am one, you are one. You know, I don't know, maybe I'm a parasite on you. <laughs> a parasite on the universe, I don't know. But I, these are mysteries. There are parallel realities. There are parallel universes. There are other dimensions and levels and spheres and places and spaces of reality. Um, but these parasites can cause varying degrees of damage or disease to the host. Religion, to me, has a lot of them or is one itself. What parasites do you suspect or detect you might be hosting? A parasite or a paradise in your mind. You can be doing something that's very pleasant and very pleasing, but there is a parasite with it. Uh, there was something on the news today about Ubers being a lot more, a lot more. there's a lot more bacteria in an Uber car than there are on a toilet seat. More than a taxi cab or uh, even Lyft. I don't know why they're saying that, but it's on the seat belt and the, I think the, the handles to get in, getting in and out of these cars. I carry a little um, bottle of um, uh, antibacterial stuff with me all the time, especially in restaurants. The germiest thing in a restaurant is the menu. So after I've ordered, then I wash my hands again. <laughs> I go to the stuba, I go in the restaurant, wash my hands, and I keep that stuff. And um, even when I use salt and pepper, I'm a little bit paranoid, I shouldn't be. Um, salt and pepper shakers, I clean again. 
Uh, now, that doesn't completely decontaminate me from the bacteriums and the germs. I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, uh, but I still like to hug and love and touch. But there's, there's, um, I do what I can and the universe does what I can. There's some bacteria that's good bacteria. There's certain, certain germs and parasites that you need. Um, there's a, we saw a big, um, gardener, my brother gardener, sink out near my front porch. We don't want to kill it. My son actually found one in his bedroom because they live down where the, the downstairs terrace and, uh, Julian does down there and those something a little baby serpent had come in that one of those doors the screen door they leave it open sometimes and they sit out in, near the water and um, the the serpent was in his room he didn't want to kill it so he actually caught the thing put a little cup on top of it and slipped a piece of paper and took it out then two days later and I said well if the baby was there there's probably the mother may be near <laughs> so we had to do a little research and I said you handle that son I ain't even going down there but then my brother actually saw it on the porch when he was coming in the house but I said we don't want to kill it because that serpent kills other uh, um, uh, eats on if you will uh, vermin uh, sometimes rats or mice if there's some we live near water um, sometimes frogs or whatever but I said this is the, this, this serpent was living here before I moved here and I made it my friend rather than my enemy I um I don't believe in, in hostile entities. I don't allow that in my consciousness, whether it's an animal or a spirit or an energy in the house. You know, I don't freak out over things that go bump in the night unless it's me. Because I, <laughs> I don't, that don't scare me. It would today. But <laughs> I, uh, I think there's a lot of freedom to, to how you think. Because, well, again, what you think about, you bring about. I study all kinds of things. I'm not afraid that an extraterrestrial will show up in my room. Sometimes I wish one would just to tell me something I don't know. I think some of my time my kids are extraterrestrials. Um, somebody said to me about his younger kids, and he said, a friend said to me the other day, you know why God made your children look like you? So you won't eat them. <laughs> you can, when, when, when kids go through a certain stage, you can understand why some animals eat their young. Uh, it's just part of this evolving development of dealing with human beings being human like cultured pearls uh, we are cultured people a cultured pearl is a is 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 a pearl that's created by a by a mussel farmer or oyster farmer under controlled conditions i think that's what most quote-unquote believers are natural pearls are formed by nature more or less uh, by chance they're both of them are beautiful, whether it's cultured or natural, and they're both expensive. Just one is more planned and plenteous than the other. The more planned and plenteous one is the synthetic, is the, the cultured one, the man-made one. And there's a lot of, I want to go back to nature, spiritual nurture and nature. Religion is cultured and controlled and more plenteous and planned. People are getting away from that. I'm not going to get to it tonight, but I have a bunch of statistics that you'd be fascinated if I, if I read uh, some of them to you. I've been studying Voltaire, uh, who's a French Enlightenment writer, historian, philosopher, famous for his wit, for his criticism of Christianity, especially the Roman Catholic Church, and his advocacy of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and separation of church and state. <clears throat> he was a sort of satirical po uh, polemicist. I mean, he, he was contentious. He used satire and humor and a little cynicism to confront in a sort of sometimes combative, but at least confrontive way, the things that he thought uh, were inconsistent about religion and that he thought, thought were harmful. He, he lived in, uh, I think he was born in 1694. So he's been thinking this all these years and I'm reading his stuff and it's like, it's so apropos today. Uh, he says, the truths of religion are never so well understood as by those who have lost the power of reason. Man, beautiful thought. He says, the Bible now, this is going to offend somebody I don't mean to, but this is his word, but it makes a little sense when you think about it. The Bible, that is what fools have written, what imbeciles commend, what rogues teach, and young children are made to learn by heart. <laughs> That's a little bit rough, but there's certain elements of truth in that. The Bible is a man-made book. Well, I take it by faith. Well, faith in what? And the same faith in God is that same faith in hell? and anger and a God, do you believe in a God that said, I 
wish I hadn't made you. This thing is jacked up. And so are you. You're jacked up. And I regret that I even made you and then drowned the whole planet except for a few animals who were evidently more obedient than humans. If you could get all these duets of animals, monkeys and baboons and raccoons and boa constrictors and crocodiles and and couldn't get one human being other than the eight out of all the thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people who lived on the planet then. We don't know how many lived. But uh, he's going to drown everybody. If he can move, motivate a chimpanzee <laughs> and motivate a mosquito or something, I mean, and can't make people. What made those animals come? How long did it take them to get there? According to the scripture, Noah preached 120 years and uh, didn't get nobody saved but his wife and kids. And then he got drunk. I would have gotten drunk too if I was that unsuccessful about getting folks saved. So I know that sounds cynical and I mean for it too because I want to make you rethink what you believe and why you believe it. Voltaire says, I have never made but one prayer to God. A very short one, he says. Oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous. And God granted it. <laughs> That's a little bit arrogant, but it's humorous to me. Now note, just very briefly, and I have just, just a couple more minutes. I want to just read. The, I don't have all 36 church statistics to read to you tonight. I have them, but I don't have time to read them. But this is the first one. 1.23% of pastors deal with mental illness. 1.23% of pastors admit that they deal with mental illness. It's common to think of pastors as perfect. <clears throat> this is a, a, um, a, um, um, uh, I forgot the report, the, the, um, but it's, it's a legitimate survey taken, I'll tell you later, I forgot it. Uh, it's common to think of pastors as perfect, but they're human too. The statistic is important because it shows that mental illness is in an area church uh, in area churches that needs to be addressed. Not only the leader, but the followers. Not only do pastors deal with mental illness, but almost 75% of pastors knew someone, a member, a relative, or a friend dealing with a mental illness. Our churches are filled with people from the pulpit to the, to the back door who are dealing with mental illness. 2.35% of Americans believe Bible study cures mental illness. That small amount. To follow up on a previous statistic, over a third of Americans believe faith can help people overcome mental illness. I think it probably can, but sometimes faith is a mental illness. You believe it in something that you can't prove. And you have an imagination and a fantasy about it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Having open conversations about mental illness in church could encourage those dealing with it to seek help and counseling along with faith-based healing. This is a survey. Regular attendance is less these days. That's something people don't realize. How churches define regular attendance has changed in the last few decades. An active member used to be defined as one who attended at least three times a week. Now that number is three times a month or less. Less. This doesn't mean they're out of reach, though. They just don't go to church as much. So attendance is down all the way across the board. <clears throat> just because you look at these big mega churches on television... Um, I know what, how it is to have your TV people make it look full when it isn't. Mm -hmm. It's rarely full every Sunday. People just don't do it anymore because they can stay at home and watch good television. Most of them are live streamed. And if you don't get this Sunday, you can get next, last Sunday or next Sunday. Um, you don't have to fight the parking and, you know, standing in line to get in, fighting for seats and, you know, all the larger givers get to sit on the front and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there was a time when people just would rush to do that, but that's sort of slowing down. The average attendance across the board any given Monday in any church is about anywhere from, from uh, 30 to 40, rarely more than 100 in the average traditional church. Now, there's a, there's a, sm a small percentage or have 2,000 or 200 or 700. It varies. But attendance itself and older people uh, are not coming as much. I took my mom to church with me, Sunday. She's 89. She'll be 90 in November. She doesn't even ask to go anymore. 
not only to not to all souls, which she loves and loves the pastor, but she doesn't go to um, uh, the churches she's used to. She just doesn't want to go. And I'll put, but she listens to Christian television 24-7 almost. She, she watches it. And she's 89 now. And she will give to some of these ministries. And um, But she's not as present as she used to be. And she and that group need this. They're, they're not going to change their minds too much in this, the, these, this shadow of their life. They're, they're coming to a close. And so there are thousands of them. But the millions that used to watch back in the days when, when I worked with Earl Roberts and we would receive something like 32,000 pieces of mail a day, that's in Earl's peak in the 70s and 80s. It was powerful. Everything was going. Rayma here with Dad Hagen, the Church of God in Christ, the Convocation, the Assembly of God, General Council. Everything was thriving. The churches were thriving. There was this new Neo Pentecostal charismatic movement. And Pat Robertson and CBN and Jim and Tammy with T, uh, PTL and Paul and Jan with TBN and all these other uh, Christian stations and Christian music and Christian concerts and Nashville. I mean, it was just this real energy and it lasted for about 20 or 30 years. A lot of that stuff has come to an end. A lot of these guys have died. And the sons that are taking over after these guys um, are pretty much killing it in some ways. That They don't have the same, they, because they it was handed to them, they don't know the price that was paid to build these ministries, the sacrifices that were made. So the sons get it, and they just don't have the same value. They don't even have, have the same virtue, some of them. And um, Robert Schuller and, and uh, Jerry Falwell, Something came out recently about him and Cohen, who was uh, Trump's attorney, and, uh, and he tried to hide some kind of pictures, something that he didn't want out. This is the president of Liberty University, and uh, who knows what will come out on some of these conservatives, because we're just human beings like everybody else. I mean, these guys are not as perfect and as they come off as being. Certain Trump. The one thing about Trump is he don't fake it. I mean, Trump just says what he's thinking. He, he doesn't believe in political correctness, and he ain't politically correct. Um, he just says what's there. He's totally unfiltered, shoots from the hip, and it's working for him. <clears throat> it may not work in the next election, but then again, it might. We don't know. So I'm just making open statements about some of this stuff. There's a lot out, and we're going to bring this to a close. I'm just saying this so that we rethink what we believe. You should be on the program. Put the information up there. Oh, it's on our, it's on our uh, um in our comment section of where I'm going to be uh, on Thursday night for two hours and uh, just carrying on a conversation and entertaining questions. I don't know if he'll open the phones. He often does, and he might, but um, I think it'll be interesting. I'm really interested in what he has to say. And uh, again, questions are answers in seed form. It takes talent to answer them, but it takes genius to ask them. Sometimes I am more, I evaluate your character more by the questions you ask than the ones you answer. What are your questions? That shows me a little bit what your quests in life are and your requests and inquests and conquests. What do you want? We all want something. We all need a lot. We all are a lot. We're all growing and expanding. Thank you for listening tonight. And, uh, um, you should think about trying uh, cannabis live on the show next week. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Jason is saying that I. He's been so. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm going to be in Chicago next week for the memorial service celebration of life for John Atkin Powell, who is the husband of. Sarah Jordan Powell, the beloved Sarah Jordan Powell. He made his transition a couple of Saturday nights ago, about 1 o'clock in the morning. There'll be a service here this coming Saturday morning at 11 o'clock here in Tulsa at the Metro uh, Metropolitan Baptist Church. Dr. Owens is actually granting us the building for Sister Sarah. He's just letting her have it. And um, people coming in from Houston and Dallas in this area for a celebration. There'll be a mass choir there, David Smith, Nicole, bless her heart, and Nogun, uh, no, no, um Nagunde is uh, Nogan Dari. I know her so well. She's worked for me for years. She's now working at All Souls. She just stepped in and just put this thing together so beautifully with uh, Sarah's direction. People like uh, Betty Nelson, and we love so much. She's coming. They've been friends of Sarah. Maybe I think maybe Kim Burrell, who's her, her goddaughter, and my daughter, Majesty, there is her goddaughter as well. We're going to go and celebrate this man. Then Monday night, next Monday night in Chicago, um, we'll be... Um, 
this coming Monday night, I'll be there with Sarah um, as John's family. He's from that area. He's the baby son of uh, something like 10 or 11 children. And uh, about eight of them are gone. And uh, But we're going to celebrate him. And there's going to be a choir there and leaders. A lot of Sarah's friends from the Church of God in Christ are coming in. She's received calls from everywhere. I mean, very sweet calls, and people are actually sending support money. She has a GoFundMe thing. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money. I, you know, he was 81, and uh, she's uh, a widow now. And so people are, we actually set up a, a card for her, a cash card. And it's on the um, Instagram and on her side. We set up a side for her because she would never ask, but we don't want her to be without money. And uh, she's got to live. She's a widower now. And the Bible says pure religion and non-defiled before God is that you visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and you keep yourself unspotted from uh, the world. That means overt secularism, secularism that doesn't recognize the sanctity of life. That's all that means. So um, anyway, Sarah Jordan Powell, um, a great woman, a dear friend for many, many years. I, I think the last, and when I saw John last in the hospital, I walked in the room, he was he had something in his throat, in his mouth, and he was on a breathing machine, and he has one kid, he had one kidney, and he was on dialysis. As soon as I walked in, it was as if he was expecting me to come. He opened his eyes really brightly and just gave me this wonderful smile in his eyes. And he couldn't talk. He was too weak to even write. He had been writing, you know, the week before. And during the time, he kept pointing and waving. I sat there with Sarah for a couple of hours, and he kept pointing and waving. It's like he was saying, I'm out of here. He had this sense of contentment, resolution about him. And I, I didn't want to tell Sarah, but I sensed he was going. And uh, I said, let's ask him about the quality of life, Sarah, if he wants to stay here. And uh, anyway, he just quietly, peacefully slipped away. A great, great man. And uh, had an MDiv, had a Bachelor of Business, uh, had a degree in jurisprudence. And he was a counselor to so many. He sat quietly, peacefully with so many people. He would listen and work. And he was just a wonderful human being. So anyway, he is, uh, has made his transition. So Friday here and then Saturday, uh, or Monday in, uh, in Chicago. Well, life goes on. How are you doing means how are you dying. I'm dying pretty good. I'm not dying as good. But we're all here. We love you. See you again the next time, okay? I might say something to you live from Chicago uh, next Monday night, but I'm not sure, but we'll have something for you. Anyway, we love you, and we want you to go out and be blessed by God and be gods. That's what you really are in your essence. Good night. See you again next time.